Okay. And um, the uh, speaker for two weeks from now is Professor Stephen Heston from University of Maryland. And uh, he'll be talking about variant risk premia. Um, it's some new work of his. It's related to some work Larry Wu and I did a few years ago. So I hope you'll tune in in two weeks. And um, um, also, um, just uh, as you may have noticed, this meeting is being recorded. So we'll be putting the video on YouTube in a few days. Um, previous talks in our BQE seminar were also recorded and are up on YouTube now. OK. <clears throat> So, um, so with that in mind, um, let me um, introduce our speaker for today. So it's uh, Glenn Schaefer, um, <clears throat> and um, I'll share my screen uh, as a way of uh, okay, as temporarily as a way of getting across his bio. So um, I heard Glenn's talk on this material in Italy last fall, it seems like a decade ago, and um, I loved it. So um, I was really pleased that Glenn agreed to do it again. Um, so he's, Glenn's best known for his work on the Dempster-Schafer theory of belief functions, especially a 1976 book called The Mathematical Theory of Evidence. Beginning in the 80s, Glenn studied the mathematical, philosophical, and historical foundations of standard probability theory and its limitations as a theory of evidence. Um, since the 90s, he's been collaborating with Vladimir Vok on uh, understanding the benefits of using betting games as opposed to measure theory as a mathematical foundation for the standard theory, and today's talk is in that vein. Uh, Glenn began his career as an educator by teaching geometry in Afghanistan in 1968, which is very interesting, and subsequently taught at Princeton, University of Kansas, and Rutgers, sure, um, and he's served as not dean. This one, not, not this one, the next one. Okay. So let me stop with the share. And hopefully, we can switch to the slides. Um, so, Glenn, are you able to share the slides? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, let's see. Uh, I have was I was practicing that a moment ago. Okay. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, these are my slides. Oh yeah, me, uh, it's working. Okay. There we are. Awesome. Okay, I am hearing some background noise. Um, I can uh, see who's not muted <laughs> as a possible suspect. Um, and um, okay, so I see Leon is not muted. Um, El Juan is not muted. Um, okay, but the noise went away, so the problem's been solved. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> okay, Glenn, why don't you get started? Okay, well, you've probably uh, seen my uh, abstract. Uh, it's about uh, testing by betting, and in particular, uh, replacing p-values, at least for some uses, uh, by how bets come out. Uh, and um, I refer to a working paper and to a book. Uh, mostly, I want to talk uh, about how um, we can uh, deal with with testing statistical models by betting, but I first wanted to uh, get across the idea that it's really much more general. The idea of betting, uh, testing by betting is much more general, and a lot of the probabilities that we see nowadays uh, are not uh, from statistical models. Uh, the probabilities we see about weather and sports and elections and earnings forecasts uh, uh, from corporations. Uh, often have no statistical model involved, but we would still like to know whether they're good probabilities. Uh, how would we how would we put them to the test? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this um, material uh, derives from my work with Vofk, and in particular, uh, that's best uh, laid out in a You're fading in and out a little bit. Fading out? Yeah, in and um, out. It's possible that. It's because some people, including myself, are not muted. So it's possible I have both putting my hand on the side of my computer where the rep. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'll try to avoid that. Okay. Uh, I was looking at the, you know, in any case, anybody's looking at my picture, they see my uh, glasses uh, glaring there. I guess we could just live with that. Uh, <clears throat> so 
so the book came out in May 2019. Uh, I could tell you, you know, if you want to have time to talk later, we, I could tell you about the uh, uh, painting on the front of it. Uh, it's really a very advanced mathematical book because it tries to explain how to base the whole theory of probability on this idea of testing by betting. Uh, but my talk today, uh, more the uh, material in my talk today is not all in that book, it's in this working paper 54. And I also call attention to working paper 47 on uh, efficient markets. Um, all this is at this uh, uh, probability and finance uh, website. Uh, so um, uh, I've already said this, I think, uh, that, um, I, but I'll give these examples, examples where we have uh, forecasts that aren't based on statistical models would include hurricane forecasting, for example. Uh, and also um, the kind of forecast we see of sports events. Many of you may be familiar with Nate Silver's website, 538.com. Uh, I, um, uh, in January, I was looking at it, and I recorded the uh, probabilities he gave for who would win the finals of the Nasca National Basketball Association. Uh, and um, today, uh, this afternoon, I would I took another look. I said, "Well, you know, when did he stop giving these forecasts?" But of course, of course, the season has been called off, and it appears that on March twelfth was the last day he gave the uh, forecast, and uh, <clears throat> they have changed. They had changed from January to uh, March. Uh, the Bucks, he thought, had a twenty-five percent chance, and uh, they're no longer. Now he thinks the uh, Lakers have the best chance. <laughs> so, uh, what do these probabilities mean? Uh, you know, of course, it's an event that's not going to happen now. <laughs> that makes it uh, uh, extra complicated. But how would you, what would you say what that would mean? And, and uh, I, I, you know, pose that as a question for you to think about. Uh, but uh, an obvious answer for people in finance is that you could take them as, um, as prices. Uh, you know, you could buy uh, the uh, 17, uh, let's see, um, you could buy the uh, um, uh, Lakers, uh, you could buy a dollar, uh, you could put a dollar on the Lakers uh, when they were at 27, you know, at 17% and sell it when they're on 27%, so you'd make 10 cents. Uh, so, um, and if you make money like that, uh, trading uh, day by day against Nate Silver, then that would be some indication that you know more than Nate Silver does about the uh, National Basketball Association teams and their prospects. Uh, I don't know how else you would test. Of course, the same story goes for, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, election forecast he makes. And many of you may have seen, uh, you know, in a few days, uh, Joe Biden went from nearly a 50% chance uh, of being the nominee to a 10% chance back to a 99% chance. What, what, are those, <laughs> what, how would you test that? Uh, you know, he's going to be the nominee or not. Hopefully that event is still going to happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, do you say that Nate Silver was right because he said 99% or that he was wrong because he said 10%? Um, you know, how else would you test except by betting? That's, uh, uh, so let's think about that. Um, you know, one way uh, we could look at some, uh, here I said instead of Nate Silver, I said suppose Alice announces probabilities for sports events. Uh, and suppose that, you know, it, if you want to test how good a forecaster Alice is, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be always the National Basketball Association. Uh, one day or one week, uh, you could look at Alice's probabilities for a tennis tournament, the next time for a soccer game, the next time for a cricket game, if Alice was giving, uh, was giving forecasts for that. Uh, so uh, what's the idea? The idea is that Alice would, uh, that Bob would test Alice by buying random variables for the expected values uh, she assigns them, uh, if she's assigning a probability distribution to uh, the outcome, you know, various outcomes, she, that constitutes, uh, you know, you could, there's all kinds of variables you could define for that probability distribution. And 
expected value. So you can say, well, we're taking it that Alice is offering to sell all these random variables for those expected values. Uh, so if Bob begins with a dollar betting against Alice and doesn't risk any more than that, uh, and walks away with $100 after a while, then Alice doesn't look very good. You know, she could say, well, I was just unlucky that time, but you know, uh, a forecaster that's always unlucky is not a, you know, doesn't have much credit as a forecaster. How else are you going to evaluate the forecasting? Now, uh, a couple comments about this. One is uh, that when I say Bob begins with a dollar and risks no more than that, uh, I think uh, to make that clear, we should say that Bob is always going to buy a non-negative random variable for whatever he's paying. And he can't pay more than he has. In, you know, he starts with that $1 that's on the table. He never puts more on the table. Does it borrow money? Uh, with that to becomes, you can't do it that way. Uh, for this to be uh, convincing and persuasive, uh, you really need to say he puts a certain amount of money on the table at the beginning, and he's not going to risk more than that, which means that if he uses it to buy a random variable, it's a non-negative random variable. Uh, because if it came out negative, he would owe more money than he put on the table. Uh, so, he, you know, he puts a dollar. So another comment here that down at the bottom, I say, Bob is not, this is not Bayesian. Bob is more frequentist than Bayesian. He's not, uh, it's not, you know, Alice, these may really be Alice's beliefs. That's not the issue. Uh, the issue is whether they fit what is happening in the world. Uh, Bayesians do make, Bayesians make bets, but they make bets on hypotheses. And we're not betting on hypotheses. If you've been on a hypothesis, what's a hypothesis? The hypothesis might be that the Lakers are the best team. That's always a hypothesis, you know. Uh, you can still believe that Baker, Lakers are the best team even if they lose uh, the season. Uh, so hypotheses are things, if you bet on hypotheses, those are bets that are never settled. Uh, so here we're talking about a bet that is settled. You know, one day, you bet one day, you see the outcome, and then you make the next bet. That's the, uh, that's the picture here. It's a perfect information game, if you will. Uh, uh, everybody sees each other's moves, and all the moves are revealed. You know, all the things are revealed before the next move. Uh, <clears throat> so Bob makes bets that are settled, and the outcomes of those bets are going to be looked at as, in a way, as measures of evidence, like we would make like a p-values as a measure of evidence. Uh, now, in in this general picture, there's no need for Bob to believe. Uh, that there really are probabilities for these events. The, the only thing is that, you know, he might say, you can't give a probability to these things. Uh, or he might think, say, I have different probabilities. Either way, the point is, that's not the point. The point is that he's uh, challenging Alice's, the validity of Alice's probabilities. Uh, he also, you know, obviously, Nate Silver is putting on these probabilities. He's not offering to bet with me. Uh, but, you know, so I can still pretend I'm betting with him. And if I make multiply my play money by a lot, it's still a case against him. So Bob doesn't need to bet real money, he can play, he can bet play money. Uh, his point is to make a, he's out to make a point against Alice, not to get rich. Uh, and Alice is not obviously risking money, Nate Silver is not risking money, but he is, he would be if we had some uh, effort to test him in this way, he would be risking his uh, reputation as a forecaster. Uh, so uh, the advantage of this way of thinking of testing is that people understand it. You don't have to take a course in probability. As a matter of fact, if you took a course in probability, it might um, get in your way because the ordinary person understands the idea of putting your money where your mouth is, of putting up the money, of having somebody take, take your bet and show you're not a, you don't know what you're talking about because uh, you, you lose. Uh, so, uh, it, Everybody understands that uh, if um, Alice knows more than Bob, and uh, you know, for example, I have three points of things that would be obvious to people. If Alice knows more than Bob, we agree he knows she knows more than Bob. But if Bob still makes money from her, uh, then the things she knows don't seem to be relevant. Don't seem to be worth very much. People would understand that. Uh, the second point is that. If Bob, if we understand and know that Bob knows more than Alice uh, and Bob makes money in that case, then we think, well, Bob's extra information may be relevant, maybe uh, makes a difference. Uh, if Bob doesn't make money, then we don't have any evidence about Alice's probabilities. Uh, Bob might just not be very sharp himself. 
Uh, on the other hand, if we have a lot of confidence in Bob, if we think he knows everything there is to be known about the uh, basketball teams and and he's also a very smart guy and he still doesn't make money, then that's actually evidence in favor of Alice's Bob probabilities. They're pretty good probabilities after all. So these are, I think, common sense ideas that you could, uh, you know, you can present. To, you don't need a course in probability to understand. Well, oh, actually, in the last point, uh, the if Bob does not make money, then well, if Bob actually loses money, then we do have evidence against uh, Alice's probabilities, because if Bob starts with a dollar and uh, winds up with a penny, then um, then that means that uh, Alice's probabilities. Let's see. I guess they are too. Alice knows more than Bob, as I think is all it tells us. They might still not be good probabilities. Uh, I mean, I would think that the, the way that we really would believe, we don't have evidence against Alice's probabilities only if Bob breaks even. Correct? Oh, I think, well, <clears throat> we could, uh, this is a good topic for discussion, but I think it, in my, uh, my thought about it is that our evaluation of, of Bob's results uh, would depend upon our uh, thinking about Bob. Okay, yeah, let's, uh, I know that we're planning on having an informal discussion after this, but we could discuss that. Okay, okay. okay. go ahead. Um, so uh, we also, uh, there's also the case where we don't have a complete probability distribution. We could test Alice, uh, even if she doesn't give a complete probability distribution. Uh, <clears throat> some of you are familiar with the imprecise probability Community on that uh, involved with that, uh, and you know, so if somebody just gives upper and lower probabilities, the, the upper probabilities are their uh, selling price, the lower probabilities their buying price. You can, uh, you know, you could uh, that gives an opportunity to bet uh, where the person, if Alice offers those kinds of uh, probabilities or those kinds of offers, then she's not claiming as much. Uh, precision or information really, but we can still test what she is claiming. Also, you know, the, the today's stock price is the price of tomorrow's stock, even though uh, it doesn't define a complete probability distribution. Uh, and earnings forecast, the same thing. If, it, if it's a precise number, we could buy at that number and sell at the actual number uh, to test. So all this is uh, laid out in our book, uh, where we talk about testing market efficiency by betting. If you beat the uh, if you beat the market with your play money in this way, multiplying your money by a large factor, uh, that's, uh, that's a way of testing market efficiency. We can see even a definition of market efficiency that avoids the uh, joint hypothesis problem, problem and all that. Uh, and um, we can also, in our book, we show how you can get uh, uh, um, properties of market prices that are usually associated with the Edo processes uh, 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 the equity premium, the square root of DT fluctuation, those are all consequences of this definition of market efficiency. Uh, if you aren't able to make money, uh, then these things are going to hold uh, to some approximation uh, in continuous time. So we actually can do the kind of continuous time stochastic uh, theory, which is, <clears throat> you know, um, pretty idealized, but uh, uh, we don't need to, to start with, with measure theoretic assumptions to do that. Uh, so just to be sure we understand, uh, here's an example. Uh, uh, Bob uh, starts with $100, uh, and uh, the first um, uh, probabilities Alice gives is probabilities for winning in a tennis tournament. Let's say all the players in, in Wimbledon, he, she gives a probability for each one of them to win, adding up to 100%. Uh, so Bob, for, for example, since we know the players, we know their ages, that defines a, a probability distribution for the age of the winner. And if the uh, average age of, or, you know, the expected value of the age of the winner, according to Alice's probabilities, is $28, uh, Bob could uh, buy that for $28. And if the winner turns out to be 25 years old, then Bob has lost $3. He's down to $97. Uh, if he bets all 97 on, a, on the next event, he might be down to zero. Then he has to stop because, remember, he can't borrow money. He can't put more money on the table. That's it. Uh, so, yeah. And, uh, Glenn, I want to ask you about that. So 
Um, is the reason that you're ruling out borrowing is because of things like doubling strategies? Um, well, if, uh, if you double, okay. Uh, um, yes, but uh, I recently wrote a paper about uh, martingales at the casino. Uh, and there's things milder than doubling strategies that make it look like, you know, if you only put the money on the table as you go, uh, you can choose strategies that often, the majority of the time, multiply your money by a lot. Uh, so yeah. it's not convincing. Uh, and in fact, it may be a, one of the yes gamblers fallacies that uh, to think you're accomplishing something, of course. So the answer to that is yes. Okay, that's clear. So you're making a nice point that, let's say if you can borrow, um, not only, let's say, might there be arbitrages in some setting with <clears throat> but moreover, um, there may, well, there may be, let's say, highly profitable as opposed to risk, riskless. <laughs> okay, as opposed to riskless. Yes. Well, we all know that we all know the big winners in the stock market are people that are managing other people's money. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> uh, but there is, Markov's theorem is relevant to that, actually. Uh, this idea of uh, discrediting a hypothesis by multiplying your money is related to the notion of testing by choosing an event of small probability because Markov's inequality, uh, Markov, this first appeared in uh, Markov's uh, 1900 book in Russian is, uh, you know, from his lecture notes. Uh, what does it say? It says when Z is a non-negative payoff with expected value mu, so you pay mu to get Z back uh, if Z is non-negative, then the probability of multiplying your money by K is less than equal to one over K. Uh, so it is natural enough to interpret, uh, you know, a um, uh, a thousand to one uh, um, uh, multiplying your money as being this evidence just as strong as if you had done a all or nothing test and, uh, uh, you know, uh, rejected because the event you had used to test has probably one in a thousand. Uh, so in the case where there is a complete probability distribution uh, given in advance, uh, this um, supports the, uh, the approach that I've been talking about. And so what I've been doing is I'm saying, let's take that intuition and extend it to cases where there's not a complete probability distribution given in advance. Because in this example, uh, you know, Alice is not telling you in advance what all her probabilities are going to be. Uh, she gives probabilities for the tennis tournament one week, and the next time she decides on the soccer game, and gives the probabilities then. Uh, so, that, you know, there's not a strategy that defines a random variable Z, uh, that Z in the beginning, but we still have the same intuition. Uh, that is a, uh, you know, I'm already halfway into my talk, but that is a kind of a general attempt to uh, persuade you. And I think as a finance audience, you may be more susceptible to this. Yeah, now you're, now you're fading out even more. Oh, uh, am I okay now? At the moment, yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, so now I get to the, what the advertised topic of my top, top, uh, advertised topic, uh, testing by, uh, testing statistical models by betting. So here we have a, the statistical model is that uh, a certain random variable Y is described by a certain probability distribution. Uh, for the, you know, for the moment, let's just uh, simplify it. Uh, not, um, you know, uh, we're testing a single null hypothesis, a point hypothesis. Uh, so the question is, how do we use the outcome, little y, to test? So the conventional approach is we choose a significance level, say 5%, we choose a rejection region uh, that has probability 5%, and then we reject if uh, little y is in that region. Uh, so uh, that already has a betting interpretation. It's a special case of my notion by betting because uh, you say, okay, we're paying, uh, we're, uh, paying $1 for a payoff that is $20 if E, uh, happens and zero if he doesn't happen. Uh, and if you get the $20 and you're bragging that you multiplied your money by 20. Uh, so already the standard testing, I'm not, this is not a p-value, but it's just a standard Damon Pearson test uh, is already uh, 
can be given this betting interpretation. Uh, how do we, but then the idea, that's all or nothing. And what statisticians have wanted to do is measure the strength of evidence. And of course, the way they did that, uh, or the way they explained it in the 20th century, in the 19th century, p-values really came out of confidence intervals. But that's history, which I don't have time for today. Uh, in the 20th century, I gave this explanation that, okay, you're going to use a test statistic to define a test for uh, every uh, significance level alpha, and the p-value is the smallest alpha of which the test rejects, and the smaller the p-value, the more evidence uh, against the hypothesis. And we teach this to our students, uh, and of course, it's too complicated. There's this crisis right now. People talk about all the, the misunderstanding, misuse of p-values. It turns out that even most teachers of statistics uh, give wrong answers when you ask them true false questions about what a p-value means. Uh, I think, you know, there's all kinds of prescriptions for how we're going to fix that by adding something to the p-value, which of course makes it even more complicated. And my claim is the problem with p-values is they're too complicated. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, can I, this is Leon. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Yes, um, going back to your prior page. So when you say I've got the hypothesis P pertaining to the random variable Y, right? Yeah. So the hypothesis P is this is Y's density function, right? Yeah. That's hypo. But there are other many, many other hypotheses you could make about the random variable Y beyond just simply saying this is the PDF, right? Correct? Am I yes. that? Yeah. So for instance, like let's say you could have hypothesis the mean of Y is greater than 10. Yes. The hypothesis, right? So it seems yes. you know, that if your hypothesis is uh, Y satisfies this density function, right? Then yep. I mean, there's a lot of structure. There's, there's a mean, there's there are higher moments and everything like that, right? So yeah. you could, could the uh, outcome little Y reject one part of the hypothesis P but not say anything about other parts of the hypothesis P? You know what I mean? Like maybe it could, it could, it could, it could reject that the mean is what P says it is, but it could not say anything at all about what the variance is what it is. You see what I mean? Yeah, well, um, I do. Um, I only plead that you let me do the simple case for today's talk. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And then, and then we have a book for you to read. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, the general uh, approach I want, so I'm saying, yeah, we're going to, uh, um, uh, in the, so the general approach for dealing with this, testing this P, uh, is you're going to choose a random variable, and I'm going to say, let's choose a random variable that has expected value one. I've already explained why I want it to be, the random variable, I want it to be non-negative. Uh, it can have any expected value, but let me choose one for simplicity, because after all, uh, the question is, uh, how much are we going to multiply our money? And so at the bottom of the left-hand column here, you see the ratio S of P over the expected value of S. And obviously, if you multiply S by a constant, you're going to multiply the expected value by the same constant. So you could normalize it so its expected value is 1, uh, if the point is that you're trying to multiply your, your capital. Uh, and in fact, you could... Uh, you could make the bet, you could make that unit one, you could make the unit of money so small that uh, what you're paying and what you might get back is negligible. So this is not decision theory. A lot of people, as soon as we're talking about betting, they want to talk about decision theory. This is not decision theory. You're just trying to make a point that uh, you can bet in a way that multiplies your capital. It's just a game, uh, but not a, seri not a serious financial game. So the betting score is the factor by which I multiply uh, the money I risk. Uh, and the betting score is what I want to replace the p-value with. Replace the p-value with the multiple that you multiply your money. Uh, if, if, if you're making a zero to one bet, then it's like a normal statistical test uh, with a fixed significance level. Uh, but instead, we're generalizing that and saying you can take any, uh, um, any random error with the expected value one and use that as your p-value. Uh, and the large betting score then rejects the, the null hypothesis uh, or discredits the hypothesis. A large betting score discredits the hypothesis P just like a small P value would. Uh, of course, as always, you can say, maybe I was just lucky, but uh, still, I think this is a good way to commit. Uh, I, I, my point at the bottom here, that this is the best way to communicate uncertainty is, 
a lot of the people who talk, you know, some of my fellow statisticians are looking at the problem of misinterpretation of p-values say, well, what we need to do is get people to accept the uncertainty that goes with statistical testing. And uh, I claim if we're talk, doing it in terms of betting, everybody understands that uncertainty. They, are, they understand that you can be lucky betting. Uh, so it communicates the level of uncertainty very well. Okay, likelihood ratios. Uh, those of you who have uh, gone further into mathematical statistics have heard of likelihood ratios. Maybe you all have. Um, let's see, if I had fewer than 27 in the audience, I might ask for a vote who's heard of the well, likelihood ratios. I will just labor on. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that in the context, in this simple case, uh, Liana is right to, to say, you know, we can do much more general things and in those cases where we don't have a whole probability distribution or we aren't testing a whole probability distribution, the imprecise probability case, what I'm glad to say is not going to be true. But in this, you know, statistical model case, uh, the, uh, where you're testing a single alternative hypothesis, uh, the betting score, as I've defined it, is actually a likelihood ratio. It's a mathematical fact. Uh, so think about what this is. I, I'm going to assume everything is discrete for simplicity. Uh, so a bet S, my random variable, is a function non-negative and has expected value one. Write out what that means, expected value one. It means that you take this possible values, multiply there by their probabilities and add up and it adds up to one. Now S is non-negative, P is non-negative. So what you have here, this product S times P is a function of little y that adds up to one. So it's a probability distribution too. So S times P is a probability distribution. That's your alternative hypothesis Q. So when you chose a bet, you chose an alternative hypothesis. You might not have wanted to, uh, you might not have been thinking about it, but hey, there it is, it's an alternative hypothesis Q. Uh, and so a bet against P defines the alternative Q and the betting score is the likelihood ratio Q over P. If Q is equal to S times P, then S is equal to Q divided by P. <laughs> Very simple, right? So on the other hand, if you started with a Q, then Q over P would be a possible bet. Okay, so uh, if you know some statistical theory, you already knew this. Uh, you knew about likelihood ratios. Turns out they're my betting scores are actually likelihood ratios. But here's a question. If you did start with Q, let's say you're Bob testing Alice and, and Alice said P and you said, no, no, I believe Q. I think Q is better. Would you choose Q over P as your bet? Not if you're naming in Pearson, you wouldn't. Why should you choose Q over P as your bet? Uh, Neyman and Pearson, the so-called the famous Neyman Pearson lemma, uh, you know what I'm, I'm talking about? If somebody doesn't know about uh, Neyman and Pearson, unmute your microphone and tell me. I've heard of them. I, I studied this years ago. Ah, okay. I've heard of them, I don't recall what it is. Okay, well, one person said they don't know. Uh, so uh, anyway, Neyman and Pearson, uh, the Neyman and Pearson limit, they said the best test is that you would choose as your critical region, the region where Q over P is biggest. Don't choose Q over P as your bet. Choose an all or nothing bet where Q over P is biggest. Uh, that's the optimal bet if you're doing uh, all or nothing bets. Uh, so let's see. Um, so here is the question. Uh, I've already said what's on this uh, uh, slide, uh, except in blue, I kind of write out that if Q over P is a likelihood ratio, then it does have expected value one. I write out a little proof of that. But I ask my question, does this make me want to choose Q over P as my bet? So the reason for our doing so, the reason I might want to choose Q over P as my bet is because this might not be the only test. Uh, if I find that the, if I find some evidence against the um, null hypothesis against P, I might want to, to look at some more observations and bet again to, to verify, to confirm. So I might actually want to do multiple testing. And this theory is really, this approach is really makes a lot of sense when you're doing multiple testing. Uh, because, if you want to know what's special about Q over P, is that among all the bets you might make, 
P over P maximizes the expected value of the logarithm. Uh, that is called Gibbs inequality. I'll say that again. Gibbs inequality tells us that Q over P uh, maximizes the expected value of the uh, logarithm. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that's related, of course, to kubek leibler uh, divergence. Uh, the, uh, if you wanted to maximize, if instead, excuse me, oops, if you wanted to maximize the expected, if you chose 20, if you wanted to maximize your expected value that S is bigger than 20, you wouldn't choose uh, Q over P. If I said you would, according to Raymond and Pearson, you would choose the critical region as a, uh, for, a Z, for an all or nothing test critical region that has the highest uh, values for each of you. But uh, why would you want to max it? So uh, why would you want to maximize the logarithm of Q over P or maximize the logarithm? Why would you want to maximize the logarithm of your score? Uh, well, John Kelly Jr. explained that in 1956. He says that uh, if S is the product of successive factors, then the expected value of the logarithm measures the rate of growth. So if you're thinking about doing this over and over and you're multiplying, so why would you be multiplying? Well, it's because you do a test. You, you, you bet $1 and you turn your dollar into a dollar and a half. Well, that's pretty weak evidence. But maybe we'll get more observations and do a bigger, a better test, a more powerful test. And now, uh, should we start with betting one dollar? Well, no, we've already made a dollar and a half. We should take the dollar and a half and invest it uh, and see if we can multiply our dollar and a half by more. Uh, and we could just keep going like that. So it's really the product of the successive uh, betting scores uh, that we want to maximize. And this idea is familiar in finance theory. I think probably this audience knows about it. It's been used in gambling theory, information theory, machine learning. It has not really been used in much in statistics. Um, and uh, so it's really the key here to the thinking of this talk. Uh, so, um, uh, so this slide brings out that idea of successive tests of P. And it says that you really wanted to, you don't want to average your betting scores. I mean, if you, you know, if you do one test and you multiply your money by one and a half and you do another test and you multiply your money by one and a half, you average them, you still have one and a half. But if you, if you uh, multiply, you got one and a half times one and a half, that's two and a quarter, right? So uh, the powerful way to do it is to multiply your betting scores. So that's the idea. Now, this leads to uh, the notion of an implied target. So we already have, as soon as we choose a bet, we've got an implied alternative hypothesis. Uh, so that implies, that implied, that, in, that implied alternative hypothesis gives an idea of what our bet is aiming to accomplish. Uh, if our bet, S, suggests that Q is the alternative, then how much can we expect to increase, how much of a logarithm of our score, what kind of logarithm can we aim for? Uh, it says, you know, if Q is what we think is really so, then we would expect to get uh, the expected value under Q of the logarithm of S as our uh, score. So you go back and exponentiate that, and that gives you a, a sort of an idea of how much you would expect to make money. If Q is the alternative, then how much would you expect to multiply your capital? That's the exponent of E of Q of log S. Oh, I call that the implied target. So we could use the implied target to evaluate the test in advance. Uh, and if we don't, the journal editor could, uh, because as soon as we say what our bet is, we've got an implied target. So even if you don't take that implied target seriously, you say, well, I just decided to test this way. I don't have any idea what the alternative would be. That's legitimate. But our critics and the journal editor can say, well, this is the, you know, this is the optimal you're, the bet you chose is optimal if Q is the alternative. So let's evaluate it under Q. Uh, and um, so before you do the, uh, the test, you have your proposed study. 
Your proposed study says, why is the phenomenon I'm trying to model? My model is the null hypothesis B. Uh, I'm going to choose the bet S. Okay, that implies an alternative Q. That implies a target S star. If that S star is like 1.1, this study is worthless. It's not even expecting to, to get any under, you know, this, this study is, is considering an alternative under which, you know, the test wouldn't accomplish anything. So it's a worthless test. Don't publish it no matter how it comes out. Don't, don't even do the, the, the study. Uh, but so, but if S star is high, then uh, you're saying, well, and if the implied alternative Q is reasonable, well, it could be Q, yeah, okay, it's worth testing B uh, with the idea that Q might be true instead. If that is a reasonable alternative and S star is big, then it's a good study, uh, whether, no matter how it comes out, because then if S doesn't uh, come out big, then you can say, well, uh, P is as good as Q or maybe better. Uh, you look at the likelihood ratio to see this. So this is a way that, that, that you could propose a study uh, and you could evaluate whether it should be published before it's done, before you get the outcome. So this would be a, you know, a, a, a you know, a deal with this publication bias problem. Uh, and so I want to conclude with three examples. Uh, three examples that uh, um, are really the major examples of the misuse and abuse of p-values. I mentioned maybe some of you have followed that literature. We could talk about it. There's an immense, uh, you know, uh, number of, of immense discussion among statisticians, uh, psychologists, medical statistics, uh, even in my own department of accounting uh, and finance. The uh, you know the American Finance Association and the American Accounting and the uh, American Accounting Association are both in the throes of this discussion too about all the abuse and misuse of p-values. Uh, what are the main uh, issues? I think one, perhaps the biggest problem is that people uh, do tests uh, where they get significant results uh, that are accidental. And they're accidental because even under the most plausible uh, alternative, you wouldn't expect that result anyway. So the noise is too big. Uh, you get to publish it because it is, the result is both practically and statistically significant, but you got to publish it by accident. There's too much noise. It doesn't really mean anything. So uh, I'm going to show you that my uh, approach would block those kinds of studies. A second, which is rarer, but is a theoretically a problem because it sort of goes against the whole idea of power. Uh, is that a test with a conventional significance level at a very high power, uh, if it rejects a, in a borderline case, uh, it's really not valid because uh, in that case, the null hypothesis will actually have a greater likelihood than the alternative. And a third case, which you know, statisticians thought they educated people not to do, is interpreting a p-value as evidence for the null hypothesis. A high p-value is evidence for the null hypothesis. Uh, in general, that's a no-no. And um, uh, we, uh, we thought we had taught people not to do that. But a recent uh, author at the University of Texas at, Dal University of Texas at Dallas, uh, William Creedy, um, went through, he and his uh, colleagues went through a uh, two years of the accounting review recently and found out that of the articles that used p-values, 33 out of 35 of them made this mistake. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, uh, oh, you know, it's uh, kind of uh, crazy. Okay, so three elementary cases. In, in all three cases, uh, the test statistic is normal, and under both the null and the alternative, it has standard deviation 10. Okay, so just for simplicity. Uh, the first case is where the estimate is statistically and practically significant, but hopelessly contaminated with noise. Okay, so uh, P says that Y is normal with mean zero and standard deviation 10. Q says it's normal with mean one and standard deviation 10. So the reasonable here, the reasonable alternative is that instead of being zero, the value is one. Uh, and what you observe is 30. Well, you know, it's crazy. Um, you know, you observe something three standard deviations away from the mean, whether it's a null or the alternative. So it's unlikely under both cases. 
And the difference is not, is, does it amount to anything, even though you could, uh, you know, you got a tiny p-value because this is so unlikely under the null hypothesis. Uh, and uh, so, but what is the implied target? The implied target is 1.005. So, you know, the editor would not have like, accepted this study under, no matter how it came out. Uh, and the actual result is so astonishing that this very extreme result uh, actually only multiplies your, your $1 to $1.34, which is not, you know, amount to anything anyway. So, uh, you know, you knew beforehand in the first place uh, that it was a bad test. The low power told you it's a bad test. Uh, this uh, low applied target told you it's a bad test. Um, the second example is that, it, you know, the, the problem here is the low, if people paid attention to power, even under the, with the standard theory, they wouldn't have done this. But the problem is that in the, in a lot of literatures, including the accounting review, people never talk about power. They get away with publishing stuff this, like this, they never mention power. So here's a case where, and they never mention power because they never tell what their alternative really is. So here, the example in this example, the advantage of, the, of, our, of my approach to this example is you're forced to tell the alternative. Uh, you tell the test, you've got the alternative. Uh, the second example is the case of a conventional significance test with a, a test with a significant with a conventional significance level and high power. Uh, so here we say, uh, again, the null hypothesis is mean zero, standard deviation 10. The alternative, same standard deviation, but let's say that y is normal with mean 37. And we observe something right in the middle, 16 and a half. It's barely significant, so you can say, yeah, I had high power, so I am justified in rejecting. But if you look at the likelihood ratio, because it's right in the middle, the likelihood ratio is... Uh, um, uh, let's see, the, um, the implied target is 939, uh, and the actual betting score is, uh, uh, the implied target is 939, and the actual betting score is only, is less than one, it's 4.477, which says the alternative was really, uh, I guess the way I set it up, it's not, exactly in the middle. Uh, it's not exactly in the middle, is it? Because 16 and a half double uh, 33 and it came out 37. So actually the null is, uh, is favored the way I uh, set this up. Okay, quickly the last example uh, where a high p-value is interpreted as evidence for the null. Uh, in this case, um, uh, the null hypothesis, once again, is mean zero, standard deviation 10. Uh, the alternative is um, mean 20 and standard deviation 10. And we observe that y is equal to 5. So it's closer to the, uh, um, to the null, uh, closer to zero than to 20. Uh, so, uh, the, um, uh, uh, but the p-value, because it's so far, from, it's really far from both of them, standard deviation is 10, so 5 is, uh, did I do this right? I guess that's right. It's a one-sided test, uh, so even a value uh, 1, half of a standard deviation away has probably only 30%. Um, but still, it's a long ways from the uh, uh, alternative. The implied target is 7.39. The actual betting score is only 3.68. Uh, so, um, uh, the, you know, the actual target, the actual betting score is 3.68. Uh, it does favor the null, but you know it would correspond to multi. If you were betting on the the other way, it would correspond to multiplying your money by less than three. So it's not really a big enough uh, result to merit attention. So um, uh, so you know it doesn't give a, a different answer than Neyman Pearson, but it uh, gives a little more clarity in my. Judgment. 
Okay, so I left us with uh, five or 10 minutes, uh, Peter. Oh, okay. Um, so um, I, um, I have a, I'll start things off, I guess. Um, could you go back to the slide with the implied target? Yeah. Um, yeah, here it is. So um, it's the calculation in the top right of the slide in the top line of the slide. Oh, yeah, I didn't speak about that, yeah. No, I know you did. Um, so I just want to make a comment. Um, so if for one second we blocked out the exponential and the log, both of them, then we'd be left with the expectation of the test. And um, that's one, I believe. Is that right? The expectation under Q. Yes. Oh, no. Actually, Expectation under P this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So um, so actually this is bigger than one, I'm thinking. If we block out the exponential log, I'm saying, and we have the expectation under Q of Q over P. Um, so then that, I think that's actually bigger than one. Okay. Yeah, it would be, yeah. Yeah, because like I say, a quick argument is we both agree that the expectation under Q of the reciprocal, um, the reciprocal p over q is one. Yeah. Okay. And now we're we're taking like a random variable, which is p over q with mean one under q, mm -hmm. and then we're actually taking the reciprocal of that. Okay. I know it's hard to explain. Okay, but when you you know from a Jensen argument, uh, the reciprocal is a convex function. So so that's why I'm arguing that the expectation without the exponential log. The expectation of Q of S is, is bigger than one. Yeah. And, so, um, you know, so you could, uh, you could say, well, I want to maximize that. I haven't explored what that would give. Uh, yeah, that's true. And, uh, okay, now with the log and the exponential, you know, there as shown, um, I want to make a different point, which is that we're calculating uh, um, a geometric mean. Yeah. Okay these tilted probabilities. Yeah. Right. And um, I, th I guess the reason for this, the reason you focus on, you know, implied target is I think you're trying to get back to, to, to something denominated in, in wealth. Is that yes. fair? Yes, yes, yes. That's after I've taken the log, I go back to the exponential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's remarkable how close, this line is to my own talk of two weeks ago, by the way. <laughs> I was uh, doing exactly this. I know you missed it, but um, so, so anyhow, it's, uh, it's remarkable. And um, so, <clears throat> so um, the, um, let's say, um, I, like I, I'm, in, I'm definitely, I'm kind of a fan of, you know, Kelly, because let's say it bypasses the need to specify a um, personalized utility function, <laughs> okay? Um, but if, if you were trying to convince an economist, let's say, who- That's pretty tough. <laughs> yeah? Well, let me say, I mean, th those are the people in my mind who, you know, sort of harbor the illusion that everybody should know their utility. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. and so in any case, I mean, I suppose a generalization available for just those people would be to replace log with an increasing concave function called the utility function and then exponential with the inverse of that function. Um, is, would you agree? Yeah, I, I haven't had thought about it. Uh, okay, with, like it, all I'm saying uh, is yeah. you know, for what it's worth, uh, not everybody agrees with the Kelly criterion, okay? Like Samuelson in particular was a famous economist who yeah. Specifically argued with the Kelly criterion. Yep. Yep. And um, let's say, but you know, all Samuelson would say is, well, don't you don't have to use log. Use some increasing concave function. Don't use exponential necessarily. Use its inverse of that increasing concave function. In yeah. Let's so say, that would lead to. I mean, I guess there's a possibility for doing a lot of math because you've got that leads to the question of what. Uh, I would say loss function. And that is going to yeah. maximize uh, that quantity. Yeah. So I know you're saying that only with log there do we get that um, S is 
the quantity that maximizes the right. mean log there. Right. Well, right. Only, yeah, right, right. This, <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. It comes in that you you want to maximize that log. Yeah. So what'll happen if I replace log with some other increasing concave function? Okay, then, then, are, then Q over yeah. P will no longer be the maximizer. Right. Okay, we agree. Right. So, and, uh, and what, let's say, what it would be instead, instead of, instead of Q over P, it would be, you know, some increasing function of Q over P, probably. Okay. Um, well, no, no, the point is that you would look for a different Q. Uh, oh. Oh, I see. What if you started with, no, you're right. If you started with Q, yeah, if you believed Q, that's yeah, right. Yeah, I'm still thinking you believe Q. Other, you would use some other function. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, you would bet differently. You right. wouldn't just take Q over P. Like a, right. a concrete example that I'm sure will work is in, if instead of log, we use a power function that's concave. Uh -huh. So for example, yeah. the square root of S. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, then, and likewise, instead of exponential, we use the inverse of the square root of S, which is the square. Okay, then, um, Instead of betting Q over P, we'll yeah. bet a power of Q over P. I'm pretty sure that's how it would work out. Um, a positive, an increasing power of Q over P. Like, you know, Q over P raised to a positive power, I mean. And um, so, so anyway, it would just be a slightly different answer is all I'm saying. Um, but um, it's still in the spirit of, you know, what you're trying to do. Um, so I'm just, you know, pointing out that there is, let's say, related theory available should one want to go that direction. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how the logic, you know, my earlier arguments about uh, the invariance if you multiply by a constant, well, okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know how my, I don't, I don't have the whole picture in my mind. It's worth exploring. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know you're you're worrying about um, the scale invariance, right? Like before, yeah, you were saying yeah. we might as well make wealth one. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, so the particular example I happen to pick <laughs> with with power function in particular replacing log will actually respect that scale invariance. Okay. Well, I and guess that scale invariance only has to do with p. Q is not in that story, so yeah. Uh, I guess that's okay. All right. Um, but the, uh, you know, if the amounts of money are so small, that would, wouldn't that change? If you, if you change, uh, somehow, I, somehow your utility function is going, if you're trying to look at a utility, only the log is going to have this feature that it wouldn't yeah. change with the scale. Yeah. Oh, so, um, so what was, okay, like, only the like the at the top of the slide you wrote s equals q over p maximizes expectation of log, and I will agree that if we change log to say a power, then s equals q over p will no longer maximize the, the mean of the power. Okay, um, is that the point you're trying to make, or is it something else about? Um, um, let's see. What's worrying me is that uh, when you change the scale. Okay. So like uh, your utility is going to behave differently. Yeah, so like uh, if you're betting a penny, uh, your utilities may look different than if you're betting a dollar. That's what's bothering me. Yeah, so that is true in general. Um, the particular type of utilities I happen to pick, which is power, uh -huh. um, just, you know, they, they respect the scale invariance you're okay. thinking about right now. Okay, so Okay. Um, so, but I agree in general, you know, if, it would, if instead of, if I had picked some other increasing concave function, I, I would be running into trouble mm -hmm. with um, the scale invariance. I'm agreeing. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, um, so, um, so anyway, when you, Glenn, when you show this to statisticians, <laughs> what is their typical reaction? Well, I'm encouraged. Uh, it's uh, the uh, usual reaction I've gotten. Well, everybody has their own thing, you know. It, it takes a long time to sort of appreciate something new. But I have been, a couple days ago, I was very flattered. And this is kind of not 
quite public information because it's not definite, but uh, this paper, my paper uh, that I'm basing this talk on has been accepted modulo minor revisions to be a red paper for the Royal Statistical Society. Oh, wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, so yeah. uh, I'm over the moon with that. Yeah. It's taken, well, I have well, to say, Volodya and I published that book, uh, tw you know, our first book 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And oh, the statisticians have not received it particularly. Uh, uh, um, and so in most talks I've made, the statisticians have not gone over so great. But, but it's, it's, it is this idea here has penetrated. Yeah, much okay. more stuff in the book. Yeah, um, I'll just mention that economists uh, are basically also believers in, let's say, the uh, information content of markets. Um, and, um, you know, so I kind of got a PhD in a very economics-based program in finance. And let's say, you know, there's sort of, for example, you know, nobody really uses surveys to understand how people are thinking. <laughs> they, you know, they, they much prefer looking at market prices and extracting information from that because basically, as you said, people are then putting their money where their mouth is. Mm. And, um, you know, so, so let's say, and I mean, there's even, you know, let's say um, parts of economics that really focus on the information content of prices. Um, which is sort of consistent with the way you're thinking. So well, I, I'm also uh, I'm also very uh, heartened by uh, beginning to make some get some traction uh, with um, <clears throat> some of your colleagues. Uh, um, I think uh, you know Volodya gave that talk at Columbia as you as you uh, that we both went to a few uh, was, was that two years ago last year. Yes. Uh, yes, and um, Karatsis has written a wonderful blurb for our book. Uh, on the back cover is uh, from Karatsis. So, oh. uh, so there's some attention there too. And that's uh, okay. to me. And uh, on, uh, there, was a, there was a group, um, uh, I don't know if you were aware, if you noticed it, uh, I might have called it to your attention, uh, at the um, CWI, the uh, Research Center in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a group there, uh, Peter Grunwald, uh, that's very interested in these ideas. And Peter and some other people uh, organized a meeting that was going to take place uh, <laughs> the last week of May in Eindhoven in Netherlands. Mm -hmm. It's not taking place, but there's a website for it. And they put together a list of speakers uh, that included a number of people from stat departments, from CMU, of course, for example, but also Berkeley, uh, who are doing things looking similar now to this. And not to my particular talk now, but to this whole idea of uh, testing by betting in different ways. Uh, so uh, I think it's getting some traction. Everybody has you know, I'm not sure they'll all use my vocabulary. Everybody does their, you know, does their own thing and makes up their own words <laughs> for it. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, so, I mean, there's this old saying where, where a student, you know, asks a professor, well, why, if you're so smart, how come you're not rich? <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, I do think that uh, that question is, you know, very consistent with, you know, the way you're thinking, which is, which is basically <laughs> that, you know, Somebody who's smart should be rich, okay? Because they, <laughs> let's say because they know the real probabilities and bet accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's open this up. If anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question, feel free. <clears throat> um, Hello. I I have uh, a question or some comments. Sure. Um, hi. This is Roy. Um, I, 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 uh, first, um, I guess Peter was looking at uh, page 30, I guess the, the equation on page 30. Uh, let's oh. see, I gotta look at my, uh, I'll try to, I'll get to page 30. Did we jump to that one? Because, um, um, I mean, what, um, I, I mean, when Peter was talking, I saw an, another interesting um, um, aspect of that, which is, um, 
it looks like um, if you look at the uh, S ln S, it, that's sort of an entropy. So it might be an, an expected value of some kind of entropy. Oh, absolutely, uh, yes. Uh, this is uh, the inequality I showed on the previous slide is the Kolbeck Leibler inequality. Right, so, so that, that could be, a, a, um, I guess, some kind of heuristic or uh, that, that could justify that in terms of uh, some kind of uh, entropy. Uh, anyway, uh, but my, my, uh, my question or observation, um, um, one was, um, there's a guy, um, uh, David Calhoun. Um, um, uh, he has, his name is, has a very um, um, a Scottish spelling. Uh, but he's been uh, talking about getting rid of p-values for many, many years. Um, he's a, uh, a biostatistician. And um, his argument was uh, not so much from the betting perspective, but um, looking at false positive rates, false negative rates. It would be interesting to see, that, uh, um, uh, I guess my question is, have you um, applied the this... Um, um, the betting uh, uh, language to the issues of false positive, false negative uh, um, uh, diagnostic type tests. I guess that's 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 the first question, and the second one is um, there's a whole world out there in the area of something called pari mutual wagering. Uh, that's the wagering associated with uh, lotteries and horse races and things like that where there are these uh, companies that compute odds called tote, tote companies or uh, totalizator uh, uh, companies. Um, supposedly Charles Babbage, uh, that was why he uh, wanted to invent his computer was to, to compute odds um, to be a tote company. Anyway, um, one of the issues there is in wagering integrity. Namely, how do you know these odds that the um, the tote companies compute are are actually uh, legitimate. They they could be subject to fraud. I mean that's actually an area in um, in the uh, in, in the regulation of lotteries and uh, and um, uh, and horses. Anyway, just just two comments or two questions, I guess. Uh, well, in response to the first question, I've uh, corresponded with David Calhoun on this uh, and read his paper. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's my only interaction. Uh, uh, but, uh, um, and I shared my paper with him and I, I can't, you know, uh, marshal all the details, but my recollection of that conversation was that uh, what Calhoun is recommending in the end comes out uh, pretty much what I'm doing. But as you say, it has a completely different rationale. And uh, in my mind, it's an infinitely more complicated rationale uh, because he starts with, okay, let's take p-values and then just add this additional layer to it. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> you know, my argument with the statisticians and, and of course, he's only one of dozens and dozens or <laughs> of authors. Uh, you may, for example, he, one of his papers is included in that collection of, of, of about 40, I think, or 50 articles by statisticians in a special issue of the American Statistician at the beginning of 2019. Every one of them, you know, he got 40 suggestions for it. Here's, let's fix the problem by adding this to p-values. Uh, I exaggerate, not all 40 articles take a quite that approach, but a lot of them do. So you got all these different uh, proposals for fixing p-values by making them more complicated. Yeah. And I tried to convince Calhoun that this would be a way of uh, kind of getting to where he was going without making, <laughs> with a simpler rationale. So that's my answer on Calhoun. On the question of the paramutual, of course, uh, you know, this is not something new. Uh, the horse uh, horse betting in the United States has has been paramutual for a century, or more, maybe a century. And, you know, the paramutual was invented by a Frenchman in the middle of the nineteenth century, I think, and uh, taken up in this country universally in the horse races. And the question of whether the track is, but you know, in the case of paramutual, 
uh, you aren't given probabilities and told these are the probabilities you can bet at because the payoffs uh, depend upon what everybody has, you know, everybody else's bets. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, know. yes, and the paramutual. That what's interesting is um, all, the whole world is all about odds, except they may they may be say inside information as to say uh, yeah, what, yeah. So what they, horse they, would you, win. So it's an interesting issue of, the issue issue of, of trusting, that odds yeah. are not probabilities. Yeah, the issue of trusting the uh, racetrack, uh, and in the in newer online versions of the racetrack, uh, that issue is, you know, it's not something that this methodology here is addressing. Absolutely not. So, Glenn, um, just to let me summarize your methodology, is it is it that your your essential sort of methodology is someone has a B, somebody else has a Q. And um, let's say to decide who's closer to the truth, we let the person with the cue bet according to the prescription you propose. And we, they start, the person who with the cue starts with a wealth of a dollar. And we basically let time run and see um, what wealth is at the end of a long time period. And in particular, we're interested to know is wealth bigger than one? or is well smaller than one. Is that fair? Um, it's, it's a kind of a special, it's a kind of a salient special case of what's going on here, yeah. It is? Uh, what, what it, what make, one thing that makes it special is that this idea of multiple testing, uh, we want to think about uh, <clears throat> the idea that uh, it might not be a single uh, investigator with a single cue. Uh, okay. You know, the idea is we have this scientific hypothesis we want to test. Uh, and somebody comes along and does a test and they multiply their money by a little bit. Uh, somebody else might come along and say, you know, I have a completely different idea about what's wrong with this model. I have a different cube, but I'm going to take and see if I can multiply more. Uh, okay. This idea. Okay that each investigator is still trying to multiply more what the previous investigator did. So it's a scientific community, possibly with diverse and changing opinions about what Q is. Okay, uh, okay, but let me- general, uh, It's much more general than this idea. And of course, I also, at the beginning of my talk, uh, addressed a different aspect of the generality that, you know, you might not even have a uh, complete P, uh, in which case you're not gonna have a Q. Uh, yeah. Let me come to my um, my comment now. So so okay. So that's fine. So let's say that there's one P and multiple Qs. Each person can bet according each to their own Q. So in the end, um, I think that I'm guessing that you're going to say that the person who has the most wealth of all these different Qs um, is the one who's quote correct. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. No? Okay, so I'm trying to actually understand in the uh, end what the criterion is for, like, is it first, I have two parts to the question. The first, what criterion are we using? And then second, um, is the output of your procedure a, a yes, no type answer, or is it actually a positive number indicating sort of degree of belief in some particular probability measure? Well, it's a positive number that indicates the degree of discredit uh, okay. for a particular theory. Discredit, okay. Uh, let me, uh, let okay. me contrast, uh, let me contrast uh, with Neyman and Pearson. Okay. Uh, you know, there was a famous, uh, those of you who know the Neyman Pearson story may recall that uh, another famous British statistician, uh, R.A. Fisher, was very put out and irritated by the way Neyman and Pearson had um, developed the theory of testing. And he said, these guys, Neyman and Pearson, they are, are just like, you know, their, their theory is good for quality control, but not for scientific hypothesis. And in a sense, this point of view here uh, agrees with, with Fisher's um, uh, insight. Because if, there, if this was not a scientific theory that you were going to uh, sort of test in different ways, I mean, a scientific theory, you don't reject it on the basis of one test, right? It, it has to endure and be tested in lots of ways. If mm -hmm. you're doing quality control, 
and you have a uh, you know a widget that comes off the assembly line, and you're going to test it. You're testing it once. Uh, if you reject it, you throw it in the pile for rework. <laughs> if you accept it, send it to market. You send it to the store to sell. Uh, so that's it. It's a one time. So for that one time thing, uh, Neyman and Pearson's approach seems to be the right approach. So this approach is more suited for scientific work. That's the uh, that's the idea here. Okay. okay. And then the takeaway is scientific, a general hypothesis. Uh, you know, a general hypothesis might give a one P for one phenomena, but then uh, tomorrow there's something new, some new uh, data you're going to get, and you're going to have a, actually, in a sense, you have a different P for that data. The theory, you crank out the theory, the quantum mechanics, we're going to test quantum mechanics. Well, it gives a new P tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so not only can you, can Q be changing, P could be changing, but it's the kind of theory you're testing. That's the grand picture. Uh, of this particular, but this is only one application of our book. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, you know, I want to advertise the book too, uh, this idea of testing by betting as a basis for probability, th for the whole concept of probability uh, has a lots of other uh, directions it can go. So this idea, this, this sort of uh, uh, implied target and all this is kind of uh, something for the uh, conventional st statistical modeling problem. Yeah. Is it obvious that uh, setting is uh, transitive or could it happen that Q beats P, R beats Q, but P beats R? Uh, well, yes. I mean, for a single, yes, it's transitive. Yes. It's transitive. Good. Yes. Well, things get, I would think that things get more complicated if you're looking at uh, more than uh, one, more than two alternatives. I mean, if you have like three or four possibilities, uh, a P would have to make a statement about uh, the probability for each of them. And then you would have Qs that would perhaps do better if it just happened that uh, what you actually observe were a series of runs of one of them over the other. Uh, did, Another, I, I move to example one here. If you have a normal distribution, there's lots of income. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what you're aiming. Okay. What I was thinking about was, let's suppose that you have uh, you're rolling a dice. Okay. Your p is let's say that okay, all six faces are equally likely to come up. Yes. Um, you have a Q that says five and six are more likely to come up than, you know, the others. Yeah. Uh, and then you have an R that um, uh, one and two are more likely to come up than the others. Yeah. Well, then. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, these are going to be these P, these R's and uh, and Q's also get probabilities for all six faces. They, they yeah, just... exactly. Okay. exactly. And then well, depending on what actually happens, I mean, depending on the actual role, you're going to observe um, each each yeah. hypothesis is going to give a, a, a probability to what happened. So yeah, you you're going to get an empirical result. Yeah, and that's a um, set of numbers, uh, and you know the yeah. biggest number is the biggest number. It doesn't matter what you're comparing it to. Yeah, I guess the biggest number is the one that that well. I guess yeah. that's the thing is that uh, you would have, I mean, if it turns out that the die uh, is loaded and maybe is loaded in, in favor of five and six, then I guess five and six, the one that uh, favors five and six would, would beat the, uh, the, the P where you're assuming they're equally weighted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, and I guess the point is that the Q would do, uh, the, the other one where one and two are equally weighted would do even worse. But um, maybe it's the case that um, two and five are um, heavily weighted, that it's loaded in favor of two and five, in which case um, both Q and R would do better than P. And they may, might be equally, equally better than P. Yeah.
Yeah, so you could have ties. Is kind of what you're going. Yeah, I guess you certainly you certainly could have ties. Yeah. Um, you could also have. Um, well, you also have another situation, which is that let's suppose that uh, uh, the only difference between P and Q is some fairly unlikely event, and um, maybe Q is a little bit worse than P. Um, for the rest of the time, but it's massively better than P for the unlikely event. Um, then I guess you'd have, well, you may have a different, a uh, fair amount of difficulty telling uh, whether Q or P is better. Yeah, well, this is just a likelihood ratio. Um, yeah. uh, it's, uh, um, you know, obviously, as you get more and more evidence, uh, yeah. more observations, if you roll the keep rolling the die, the likelihood ratios are changing. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess so. And point a, at, at every stage, there's a maximum likelihood estimate, as we know. Right. Yeah. So that's the one that has the highest likelihood. Yeah. That depth. So, Glenn, I guess this raises the point. Like earlier, you said the outcome is a positive number that is a measure of discredit to the original P probability. Yeah. yeah. And that's fine. And I think I'm guessing the way you're thinking is that as we move through time and keep accumulating evidence, this positive number keeps changing. And um, like, let's say the, the output is in the end, um, let's call it a positive stochastic process. <laughs> that is the measure of discredit against P. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. But of okay. course, uh, this is just, you know, uh, this talk is just focused on P values. Uh, in the paper that I've been uh, advertising, the second, there's a second, a fourth section or fifth section that uh, talks about um, uh, confidence intervals, uh, which statisticians are also fond of. And there's an, ana there's an obvious analogy to the confidence interval. And that is, you know, the, uh, <coughs> the, um, uh, the, possible, the, the hypotheses that come within uh, a, a certain distance of the best one. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, instead of a 95% confidence interval, you can have a 100 to 1 or 20 to 1 warranty interval is what I call it. Uh, and uh, one advantage of that over the usual confidence interval is that um, it doesn't depend upon fixing the sample size in advance. Um, uh, this is, so this is Martingale thinking. Um, I am working with some, uh, in 2009, uh, some colleagues and I in the journal, electronic journal for the prob history of probability and statistics put together a special issue on Martingales. Uh, and a couple of those articles in there were about applications of Martingales to statistics. Uh, and uh, Martingales are very important in a couple branches of statistics. Um, uh, sequential analysis that Abraham Wall did during World War II and immediately afterwards is really about Martingales. Uh, Martingales have become very important in survival analysis. And so we have articles by statisticians on those two topics. And the stuff they're doing translates into this language very readily. Uh, and this what point of view would simplify the interpretation they give to it, but but uh, <laughs> it's going to take me a long time to uh, to uh, persuade them of that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but similar ideas, but I, I it came to my mind because this idea that you know there are paradoxes in statistics about how you have to fix the sample size, otherwise you are you know you you can be arguing to a foregone conclusion. Uh, just keep, just keep testing until, uh, you know, you can reject. Mm -hmm. uh, this, um, uh, this kind of, if you're testing by betting, then it's completely legitimate to keep testing. And you don't have these uh, paradoxes that uh, you can reject with probability one just by keeping going. Uh, because when you're, when you're with the usual theory, what you're really doing is you're cheating. You're saying you're doing one test and then you say, oh, now forget it. We'll do this next test. <laughs> so you finally come to a test that uh, rejects. Of course, the same thing. And the multiple testing problem, you know, throughout many 
implications of those things. That's what's bothering people now. That uh, you do, you do, you know, in psychology and experimental psychology. You, some of you may have seen this literature in experimental psychology. You know, the psychologist does some experiment with uh, as big a sample size as he can. And, you know, as big as class, student class as he has, has all the students be his subjects, and he tries something out to see if something has an effect on how they judge certain things. Uh, it doesn't quite work, so he changes a little bit and tries again and keeps trying until he gets something that has a 5% uh, significance level and he can publish it. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that he found a result that only happens one time in 20, but he, he you know, 20 things to find it. So it doesn't mean anything. Uh, so that problem of multiple testing, uh, I, you know, in this talk, I, I addressed one aspect of multiple testing, but all of these different aspects of multiple testing uh, are dealt with very elegantly by this approach. Uh, uh, so I think that's, um, you know, why I think that time, the, the, these ideas, the time has come in part because of this crisis uh, over the uh, over significance testing. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I think we've um, come uh, to. Can Can I ask a quick question here? Uh, yeah. This is Pierre, even I'm a very naive person in that domain. But you know, since I was at home, <laughs> um, I was listening to you. So in this example of this uh, professor of psychology trying again and then again and then again, how did you? How can you debunk his approach with your bet strategy? Is his gain is getting smaller and smaller, and at the end, it just means that he's betting nothing and get nothing. Well, he has to start uh, with a, a certain capital, and he says, "Okay, yeah. I'm going to try to play this capital." If his first test only multiplies it by 1.1, okay, he can. The next one, he's got 1.1 to work with. But if his first test comes out, instead of making money, he loses money, and he only has 90 cents. Then he's trying to multiply that 90 cents to make it big, right? So um, uh, it's not, you know, it's not that it, the, if he does some tests where he gets a small effect, uh, they help him. He has to accumulate them, but it's the multiplication uh, is the idea. You, you, and uh, if he does some stupid things and uh, that's going nowhere, he's going to actually, his capital is going to go down instead of up. It'll make it harder for him to come to some conclusion. But in mm -hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, the other approach is that, you know, uh, if uh, he's going to do 20 things uh, and you only allow him, uh, you know, another way is the sort of like the Bonaferroni uh, adjustment that people talk about is that you've got to take uh, your significance, take your p-value and multiply by 20. Uh, so this actually gives you a little more hope of getting something than the, uh, if you do the conventional adjustments in an honest way, uh, you're completely devastated. Whereas this might give you more of a toll to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's uh, wrap up. So Glenn, I just want to say thank you very much. Um, so I'll applaud even if uh, you can't hear anybody else applauding. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> And uh, so anyway, um, thank you all for, for coming. I know that there was an announcement about a wine and cheese. Um, I think, well, we pretty much used it up with uh, asking questions of Glenn, but if you- um, I'll have a beer anyway, thanks. You'll have a beer, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so just remember that we'll be having a talk in two weeks as well um, by Steve Heston. And um, I uh, hope you, um, I'll, um, I'm, I want to thank you again for, for coming tonight. Thank okay, um, thanks. So I'm signing off. All right. Thank Bye. you, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.